So in this video, we're going to talk about, um, in chapter 36, we're going to talk about K-12 to education. The, you know, when we think about um, the rights that we as Americans have, we obviously have a lot of rights, right? Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. But in terms of um, things that <laughs> as citizens we're entitled to, my take on the world, you know, having now lived 44 years, is that there are very, very few things um, promised, right? You're not promised Social Security. You have to earn a certain number of credits, and then it will be there only if it's there. Um, even for things like voting, for instance, right, we all have a right to vote, except, right, we know that in some states, for instance, if you have a criminal record, you can't vote. Um, there's all the issues in terms of like access to voting machines, right? And then there's all the other kinds of um, access, to put it lightly, drama that exists um, for some. Um, but K-12 education is the one few um, thing promised that every child has guaranteed access to free um, education up until um, grade 12. Um, children do not have to pay tuition. And um, even if a child has special needs, um, the state and the federal government have to provide accessible education to that child who has special needs of some kind. That's really the only thing promised. It's K-12. College is not promised. Um, some states are making it so that um, the free education extends to community college, but most are not. Um, so with that said, why is that the case? Let's start to talk about this. Um, the reason for the investment is um, that it's an investment in capital, more specifically human capital, which is basically like knowledge. So like capital for an economist is basically um, buildings, machines, equipment. When we talk about human capital, we're talking about um, the skills you learn as you go to school. Now, what skills do you learn, right? Well, part of it are social skills, right? Like how to make friends, etc. cetera. Um, but part of it is too, is basic literacy skills, um, basic mathematical skills. Um, that basic knowledge um, allows a person to be a functional member of society. Um, and it used to be the case. And I mean, you can still find paths for it where um, having that high school degree is um, what one at a kind of a basic minimum needs to um, be able to um, get a job. Without a high school diploma, one can get a GED and a GED will get you most of the way there without a high school degree and without a GED you're hoping for an incredibly tight labor market where the employer would have to relax their minimum requirements now the frustrating thing for some would be that some of you are getting a college degree and it may be that that job 10 years ago or 15 years ago maybe only required a high school degree. But, you know, that's, that's a different topic here, a different matter. Um, the way that the education itself is financed, well, it's different across different schools. And, and that's something that we'll talk about in this chapter. Certainly in Hawaii, it's a bit more unique than it is on the mainland. we spend a lot of money on public schools, both at a state level and at a federal level. For the most part, 
Public education is a state responsibility, not a federal responsibility. The federal government really only gets involved with um, special education. Um, for the most part, um, in most schools, um, most school districts are financed in two ways, by the state and by the local community. And the state and the local community create a school district that the school then exists in. Parents might have to pay some nominal fees, like a student activity fee or a rental, textbook rental fee, but those are generally pretty minimal. This is primarily a state and local government responsibility to provide this education. Um, we certainly saw during the pandemic the importance of a K-12 education. You know, if if parents didn't have access to K-12 education, the problem we would run into is that um, parents would have less access to the labor market because they would need to watch their child. For So for, so for some parents, um, K-12 education is really kind of like subsidized daycare, right? But that's a parental choice. You know, I, you know I'm a parent. I... I don't get involved in how little or how much another parent prioritizes their child's education. Dude, I see it all the time on both levels, right? Where I see more often than not where the parent, you know, doesn't give a shit and, you know, isn't involved in the child's homework or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Not because they don't care, rather they've got a lot of responsibilities, right? So I'm not when I say they don't give a shit, I mean like they've got other things that they really have to care about, putting food on the table. Um, and so the parent sends a child to school, and generally speaking, most parents really want to make sure that their child finishes um, 12th grade education, high school education. And with that high school degree, one is generally able to enter the retail industry, for instance, um, coffee, barista, you know, McDonald's. None of these, I'm not denigrating any of those things. Those are jobs that um, in most communities, you know, they can provide survival style jobs. It's not going to be great, but it will be survival. And you'll get that because you finished your high school degree. Now, <laughs> the reason why the government provides this then, as you saw in the last slide, part of it would be is that um, the state gets access to those labor services for um, parents who otherwise would have to stay at home with their kid, um, pay some daycare for their kids. But also, again, too, children become parents. They become adults. They become taxpayers. And by a person becoming high school educated, we generally believe that they will be better voters. They are less likely to be criminals. They will have higher income than someone who's not. You know, out of curiosity here, I'm going to just... Um, My guess is that West Virginia is lowest. I guess. Bam! Look at us! Huh? Look at fucking us. I didn't even know that that was true. Look at us. Damn. We're very rarely... Okay, well, Montana fucking beat us. But for the most part, we're generally... Eh, Vermont beat us. Okay, New Hampshire beat us. Maine beat us. But 92%? Come on, we're very rarely at the top of something. That's pretty darn great. Um, my guess was the really lowest is California. Why is California so low? It's interesting. Texas is low. I was going to guess Mississippi, Alabama, West Virginia. Wow, some of these are very low. Hmm. I was just curious. Um, 
And so we can graph this out. I'm not going to ask you to do that. Um, in this class, we're kind of concerned a bit more about the social issues and how an economist understands them than actually graphing it out. But even if you just look at this graph here, what it basically represents is that the individual child gets a benefit to having a high school degree, right? They get a higher paying job. So that would be this private benefit right here. But again, the idea is that um, the community benefits as well. And so there's an external benefit that kind of shifts the benefit curve outward. So that's our social benefit. So when you see a social benefit curve that's greater than the private benefit curve, which is right here, that's when we see the um, justification for a subsidy, which is what happens, right? Is that for the most part, the state and the local government subsidizes it. Now we spend a lot of money. Um, we spend a lot of money on um, education in many states. The Department of Education is among the um, largest portion of a state budget um, besides Medicaid. Um, if we were to look at the Hawaii state budget, I'm not sure if I'm going to see just a quick graph here, but I'm just going to look really quick. Man, look at that. Why we beat them only marginally for college, though. Sorry, I'm really not seeing the category. Okay, I'm going to click on images just to see if I can find the graph. Here we go. This is from 2016, so it's a little bit dated. Or 2014. But here's UH, which we'll talk about in the next chapter. K to 12 is right here, 15%. So yeah, it's about as high as Medicaid. 47.8, that's like all the other shit. So it's a big amorphous category. But yeah, K to 12 education and Medicaid generally the two biggest things for any state, and that's certainly the case here for Hawaii. Now, the question would be then, if you're unhappy with the public education system, which right, sometimes, especially in Hawaii, seems to be the case where people complain um, about the, the quality of public education in Hawaii, um, the question would be is, well, maybe we should spend more. What would that spending more do, hopefully, right? Well, the one thing would be is you'd have more classrooms or more teachers in the classrooms. You would have um, higher graduation rates, um, more technology, or in the case of Hawaii, um, air conditioning. These would all be things that um, you would kind of push for if we spent more money. And in fact, what we see is that after the 2008-2009 crisis, um, education has fared quite poorly, both higher education as well as K-12. Um, teachers, public school teachers are not receiving enough support. Um, and it's not just in Hawaii, it's across almost all states. Um, spending is falling, it's being taken. If you're a, we get a little bit of a differing opinion, at least from all the common things I've heard. The differing opinion would be if people would say um, Republicans or those who are a bit more right leaning would say, you know, teachers are, um, they, are all part of a union, they get overpaid for what little they do. So they are like, 
like they have a stranglehold on the system. They don't care about child learning. They just want to get paid. And so then those politicians generally want charter schools or they generally want um, subsidies, uh, like a subsidy that a parent can use to send their kid to private school. So it's kind of like a defunding of the public school system. Others would just say that, um, you know, we're, we're spending less, um, but we're like, do, we're spending money on the wrong kinds of things. So we're like teaching to a test or we're teaching a curriculum that maybe a child doesn't need. Um, those could all be things as well. <laughs> With children not voting, um, when a budget, state budget is in crisis, as most, almost all states were after the 2008 crisis, dude, kids take it. <laughs> uh, I don't know how else to simply put it, right? You're not going to cut Medicare. You're not going to cut Medicaid. Well, you will, but you're not going to cut it as much. Um, you're going to cut kid funding, basically, because it's easier to do. And that's what you kind of see here. You see, again, that there are fewer students per teacher. So we, you know, we're making progress there. SAT scores are not really um, improving. They're either steady or slightly declining. We are seeing, again, more students graduating from high school. But again, if you look over this time period, I'm not sure what kind of progress we could talk about having because whereas you could get jobs in 1964 without a high school degree and having a high school degree was enough to have a very well-paying job. Um, today, it's um, not as useful. And I say this as a person whose parents graduated from high school and that was the end of their educational journey. Nothing wrong with it. Um, it was enough to, you know, raise my sister and myself and buy a house and all the kinds of, um, you know, trappings. But at the same time, with just a high school degree, um, it wasn't luxurious, as I <laughs> talked about in the Head Start chapter. Um, and that was 30 years ago, 40 years ago. One would have to imagine that it's only worse now. Well, it is worse now. So before we um, just say, let's just spend more money, and that's kind of um, what our solution is going to be, um, we have to remember that the, the, the structure of the public education system has become more complicated. And the biggest part component to that is the spending that's done for special education, right? This would be both physical, developmental um, disabilities, um, impairments that schools are required by law to accommodate. So for instance, if a child is born without legs, right, and they're in a wheelchair, the school has to be publicly, it has to be accessible for them to wheel their wheelchair in. Um, or, right, if a child has, um, is nonverbal autistic, then they would have, um, they would have access to um, um, speech therapy services. Um, you know, my, um, sorry, I always get so personal in all these lectures, but it's, it's just a further example. Um, my, uh, middle child is deaf. And so here in Hawaii, we have a school for the deaf, um, you know, funded by the department of education, but right. Instead of, um, 
verbal instruction it's uh, sign language um right and so you have um you know and it's a free publicly accessible education well so see all of that that special education spending is pretty expensive um and if it's now one in ten of your students you can see where some of that money is going um the other part to this as well is that the school building itself has become more complicated and the process of learning has become more complicated. There's obviously much more technology in a classroom and um, there's obviously things like air conditioning and whatnot that put further burdens on the budget for any school. Now, the one thing that came out of the Bush administration, the second Bush um, administration was a law called No Child Left Behind. And so the idea here was that um, there was going to be an exam that would be given to students and that students would need to pass these exams. And if they didn't pass these exams, then the school and or the teacher was punished in some way, right? Either reduced funding or something along those lines. Um, and so you hear about this kind of idea where teachers get frustrated of having to teach to the test, but um, this pretty much, the No Child Left Behind Act has pretty much shaped the way that the um, classroom, the public classroom exists. Um, where these exams need to be taught towards, because if they don't pass the tests, then the state and the locality don't receive as much funding. <coughs> Quite surprisingly, or maybe unsurprisingly, depending on your um, perspective, for the most part, the literature and economics really doesn't see a very strong relationship between how much you spend on public education and how well children do. Um, so if you're running for office and you just say public schools suck, my solution is spend more money. Dude, you haven't told us a solution. And unfortunately, most politicians really do stop at let's spend more money. You know, I'm not a again. I'm and I, I state my, I'm stating my personal belief here. You don't have to agree with me. You can totally disagree with me. I'm I'm not a Republican. I'm not a. Um, I didn't vote for Bush the second. I don't think I did. I may have, I actually don't remember. Um, but you got to give him credit. The, the credit is that he didn't just say, let's spend more on public education. Th there was a plan um, to spend more money through, um, to spend more money through um, the No Child Left Behind Act. And as controversial as that is, that was an attempt at a solution. The other part to this as well is, um, you know, we spend a lot of money on training teachers. Um, and, you know, we can try to put more child, more teachers in the classroom or give teachers fewer students. But the problem is that the benefits, there's not a lot of benefits to it. And you see this with this kind of flattening of the production function. You know, I'm not sure. Um, well, you're a product, at least, of a public higher educational institution. I mean, I went to a private university, pretty expensive one. Um, I'm not, you know, if I just went off of what did I get out of it that someone at a state school got out of theirs, I'm not entirely certain um, I could list a bunch of things that I got better than someone that would go to a prominent uh, public school. What does that 
basically you suggest, again, the ineffectiveness of just spending more money to get better results. Now, if we want to reform the system, this is where things get controversial. The one would be that the public school is a monopoly. And so because the DOE, for instance, doesn't have to um, be dynamic, it doesn't have to care as much as, let's say, um, someone like a private school, right? So if I'm Punahou or Iolani, right, and they start um, declining in quality, then parents will stop sending their children there. If you're unhappy with your public school choice, there's not as many options. And so some would say that to make DOE schools better, public schools better, we need some more competition, either amongst public schools with the idea that if a public school doesn't get enough students, it should close, or that public schools have charter schools as their competition. Basically, it's the, the first bullet, major bullet point here is a um, suggestion that um, competition will increase the quality of the outputs. The second bullet point, uh, it's hard for me to be unbiased here in talking about this one. Um, but I, I really want to just clear something up here. Because you hear this term a lot, both in higher education as well as DOE tenure. Um, let me explain it from the perspective of me as a state of, of Hawaii um, employee, state employee. I am protected in two ways as, as an employee. One, myself as a state employee, like all state employees, um, my boss, you know, my supervisor, cannot just um, cannot just fire me for no reason. Like, for instance, someone like my wife could be fired. You know, she's a she's employed by a private employer. Uh, she's an at will employee. So at will employees, as almost all employees are in the United States, with the exception of public employees, at will employees can be fired for any reason. They could just be like, I don't like the green shirt you're wearing. The only kind of protected classes would be racial, gender, or pregnancy, um, or disability. But for the for the most part, you are if you are fired um, as a um, public employee, um, there there are further protections. That is not tenure. That's just being a state employee. Tenure is something very different. And as I talk about it here, I'm going to sound passionate about it, but there is a reason to be passionate about it. Um, to have tenure means um, it's not that you spend 10 years there. It sounds like 10 years, but tenure means that you've spent a certain period of time with an institution. You've put in an application with that institution to demonstrate your worth. And then what tenure allows me to do, protects me in doing, is to say things in this classroom, right, in this video, that may sound controversial or may not be widely agreed upon, but I can't be fired or punished for holding an unpopular view. Um, that's obviously very different. Um, it's not freedom of speech necessarily. Um, it, and I say this as a professional, right? As, as a professional professor, um, it's my job to teach you and I can't be um, filtering what I say because I have to worry about what my boss thinks, right? Like, you know, any number of things that exist in today's um, culture, right? Like, um, 
kind of looks think great. What if I, you know, uh, I'm not, <laughs> I don't care what your belief is. You don't have to care what my belief is. But if this were like a public health class and I talked about the value of immunizations and booster shots, um, I shouldn't be fired for holding that belief, nor should I be fired for a belief if I believe that like that, you know, like that ivermectin, the, the horse dewormer can solve COVID. If that's my belief as a professor and I profess that, you can disagree with me, but I can't be fired for it. Um, we see it with also with the um, the thing we're seeing it right now is with critical race theory, um, where teachers are not allowed to discuss race in the classroom. Um, or you would see it with talking about like safe sex practices, right? Like using a condom or you know, things like or abstinence or something, right? Um, again, if you have tenure, you should be allowed to talk as you want in the classroom. Um, I'm not sure that it really adds to the cost of school. It's not that the existence of tenure is expensive as the kind of the sub bullet point highlights tenured teachers cannot be fired for poor teaching that's actually incorrect um i as a i am a tenured professor but he's also tenured teachers in the k-12 classroom they absolutely can be fired for poor teaching the bar is a little bit higher but you absolutely can be fired for poor teaching performance. But you'd have to be pretty bad. I, I will say that. It's not like, you'd, you'd have to be pretty shitty. Um, not that saying something, right? And I'm sure you've all had bad teachers, bad professors. Yeah, fuck, I might even be one of them, right? Um, but um, those bad apples are fortunately a bit more of the um, exception rather than the rule. I talked a lot longer about this than I should have, and I'm sorry about that, but um, it was important to, to get that out of my system. <laughs> um, um, other kinds of ways of maybe trying to make the public education system a little exp less expensive would be to have teachers not be unionized, um, maybe to get rid of their pensions, um, which are more expensive. It honestly doesn't add that much because you would have to then pay teachers more if there wasn't collective bargaining. So if they don't get it as a pension in terms of their compensation, they're going to get it, it as higher pay. In Hawaii, for instance, public school teachers who start out get about like 30 something thousand a year, which as that number sounds to you is pretty, pretty, pretty low. But the reason why people can be a public school teacher is because their spouse typically has a job in the private sector. And then the family relies on that teacher's benefits, which are much more generous, and they rely on the other spouse's higher pay to make it in this world. And then again, the other idea is if you increase competition, you have vouchers, you have charter schools, maybe this will make the schools better. Um, more expensive, uh, less expensive. Um, you know, the other kind of problem we have here is the whole recruitment issue of who decides to be a teacher. It used to be the case that women, primarily women, would choose to be a, um, a public school teacher, and that was kind of the um, accepted reason why a woman would get a college degree in the first place. Um, that's not the case anymore, right? Now that the labor market has largely opened up to men and women for all professions, um, what you see is that um, 
there are both more men in the in the K to twelve classroom, but also that starts to drive the um, wages up, but also perhaps lower the quality. I will say, as a kid growing up in the eighties, um, it was a little bit odd. I didn't actually have a single male teacher. I don't think until I hit middle school. Reflecting a fact that right by the 80s, many of those women who I had as teachers would have been in their career 20 years, 30 years, which would have meant they were trained in the 70s and 60s when bright women chose education as their major. And then I get, I'm guessing, right, then the few teachers I did have in middle school and in high school that were men, um, you know, sometimes it was in a bit more of a male dominated job, right? Like shop class or um, <laughs> for some reason, a computer science class. I remember there being a male teacher there, uh, PE, there was a male teacher for the boys, and a female teacher for the girls. Um, I didn't have that many. Um, you know, it, 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 it does, the, the nature of the classroom, um, who the teacher is, is still largely um, a female-dominated profession, which, um, good or bad, um, and, and I say bad because what tends to happen is when a single gender dominates a profession, you do see lower wages, and you see that certainly in education where public school teachers do make incredibly low amounts. Um, but again, for women, that used to be one of the few professions they could have. Okay. Um, oh, I should say, uh, no, um, I'll say it in the next lecture when we talk about K-12 education. Or sorry, when we talk about public higher ed.